The ice on the windshield makes a really nice light diffuser, looking right at the sun. <laughs> It is a beautifully sunny Monday morning. Haven't had a sunny day in quite some time, especially up on the mountain. It's always gray up there. I am listening to the archaeology mind, and he's in the midst of a fascinating discussion right now about dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter, which most people associate with the quote-unquote reward system, but that's kind of old thinking. Dopamine is more about desire and seeking. It's about expectation. And in this light, he's discussing how dopamine likely creates our sense of time. That the seeking system in the brain, which is mediated by dopamine, creates these expectancy narratives and these anticipatory narratives that allow us to feel time. Are we moving closer to something? Are we um, too far away from something? The brain measures our progress towards something that we are seeking using dopamine. I'd never heard that before. And that's fascinating to me uh, that people with Parkinson's, which is a disease of the dopamine system, they go into kind of like a paralytic sleep where time doesn't pass. There was a movie about this, uh, Awakenings, uh, written by Oliver Sacks, I think, starring Robin Williams and Robert De Niro. Anyway, starting out feeling kind of sluggish, but that's okay. That's normal. I'll work my way into it. And, uh, yeah. Okay, here we go. Monday. It is a beautiful March morning. I'm going to go ski early today. Finishing up an hour ski, and I think I've dialed in the missing piece of the Kruger technique. Uh, got to take a client call here in Nancy's Nook, and then I'm going to go out and maybe film what I'm working on and see how it actually compares to Simon Kruger. This is about a 9% grade coming uphill, and I'm going to work on my Kruger polling. So what I was watching him do in the World Championships up a hill about the same steepness. He was really getting up here and then kind of falling his body and then whipping his arms. So what I've been doing or what I thought he was doing erroneously was this. I thought he was doing that. Because if you're not really paying attention, that's what it looks like. But what he's doing instead, coming up here falling, his knees collapse, he falls into his arms, uses the weight of his body, and then whips. So it's a wham, wham, with lots of leg drive. So I'm going to try the arm whip, and we'll see how it looks. I don't know. Only 12 hours to go in the archaeology of mind. He's into the fear system now. And I'm thinking a lot about the fear circuitry in the brain and how easy it is to identify with the fear that you experience, to fuse with the affect or the feeling. And a lot of my work and what I personally practice and coach is to diffuse, to separate from the affect. There is fear in my body. There is a feeling in me. It's not comfortable. I don't like it. It's not pleasant, but I don't have to make choices that are based on that feeling. I can make other choices. Like right now, I really don't feel good. I'm having a rough morning, but that's okay. I can still step regardless of those feelings. The feelings don't have to drive my behavior or my thinking. They might change the flavor of my actions a little bit. They might change the speed a little bit. That's okay. Still going to take action. 
So, who was it? Franklin Delano Roosevelt who said there's only one thing to fear and that is fear itself. So they call that affect tolerance. Can you tolerate the feelings in your body? Like the fear of fear is panic. <laughs> I'm afraid of the experience of fear. So if we can learn to tolerate and be gentle with the feelings that arise in us and not use our powerful cognitive hardware to make up stories about the feeling, about the fear, about the feared object or feared outcome, if we can pull away from that story engine and just let the feeling be something happening in us, then we can continue to make wise choices in the midst of those feelings. We can continue to be productive and effective and not burn bridges or make grievous errors in our haste to run away from the feeling. Okay, I'm going to walk away from the car and up the stairs and into my studio and gently into my day. Having an SVT attack. So stopping, taking in the view, the blue sky, there it is. <laughs> There's more in front of me. Ah, oh, pretty day, just chill until my heart comes down and do some breathing exercises. Okay. There we go. Somebody drop some crackers? Huh? You want some help with those? No, oh, no? Okay. Here, I'm gonna take a few out of the pack for you. Here you go, kid. There you go. I've got the squeaky chair. Uh, say no instead of yes. No. It only makes sound when I say yes. Mm. Off to a really late start today. Uh, didn't sleep much last night. There was a creature banging around and kept waking me up. Uh, it's common, old houses in the woods. <laughs> so I'm taking my time. Got myself showered and shaved, checked in with some clients, talked to my family. I have some projects that we need to work on, trying to coordinate that. And uh, solving a debate over the maple syrup, which turned into a fight the other night because <laughs> they were certain that the maple syrup was contaminated with mold. But as I told them, there's other compounds in the syrup. It's not just water and sugar. Um, so I showed them an article this morning on what they call niter, which is potassium nitrate, which is a compound that is in maple sap. And it turns into like a floaty, congealed, almost like a kombucha culture, like a scoby in the maple syrup, but not as thick. And uh, they were scared that it was a creature growing in there. <laughs> kombucha maple syrup anyway i showed them the information this morning and they were uh their fears were allayed but uh it's interesting how quickly people can jump into a conclusion and then get upset about it without taking the time to do the research and finding out okay well what else could be in the sap beyond sugar and water there's got to be something it's the blood of the tree uh, let's look it up but no People in general, not just my family, but people in general tend to jump to conclusions without doing diligence, without taking the time to say, hmm, I don't know, let me look.
This is the worst driveway. <laughs> I'm about to do an easy ski at Prospect with the race on Saturday. I don't want to do too much today. So maybe 10 miles or so at a comfortable pace, which is not all that easy for me because working on my V2 technique and trying to use Simon Kruger's race technique, I don't know what it looks like for him to ski casually. I only know what his race technique looks like. So this is something I have to consider. I'm trying to ski like him racing. Uh, it would be good to find some video of him training at a comfortable pace. <laughs> because my V2, when I'm out here training, is not always a comfortable pace. Um, because I'm engaging in a way that is more aggressive. So that's something I have to figure out. But it is getting easier. I got some tweaks the other day that are really shifting things and it's exciting because I'm feeling myself using less muscular energy and going faster. Uh, and again, that's why I love this sport. There are so many little secrets to unlock and rewards waiting for you. you know, this just doesn't happen in running. So, um, I'm still fascinated by the deliberate practice that I'm putting into skiing. I've never ever in my life worked so intently on something before. So it's opening up parts of my brain and behavior that uh, have been locked away. So it's changing me. This sport is changing me. We'll see if it changes me in a good or bad way. I don't yet know. I ended up cutting that ski short, just about half an hour. I had some tea with stevia in it, maybe 45 minutes before skiing. And if you don't know, artificial sweeteners, or should I say sugar substitutes, because stevia really isn't artificial, but it's a substitute, it's non-caloric. It will actually steal blood sugar from your blood. So the receptors to produce insulin, or should I say the triggers for insulin production are in your tongue. So whenever your tongue tastes something sweet, it sends a signal to your pancreas to produce insulin so that it's ready by the time the sugar enters your bloodstream to pull it out. So if you eat something that is artificially sweet, non-calorically sweet, you're going to produce insulin and you're gonna pull what little blood sugar you have out of your blood. So if you can eat anything with stevia or any of the other non-caloric sweeteners, make sure you're also eating something with sugar so you don't crash like I just did. Um, I could have had a snack and continued to ski, but I thought, uh, I've got a race in two days, I'll just take it easy, half an hour's enough. Um, but uh, yeah, it doesn't feel good to have low blood sugar while skiing. <laughs> All right, back to town, do some work. See you in a bit. Somebody's spilling out of the chair. They were talking about Joe Klecker and how he's so good over 10,000 meters, but this is Woody Kincaid's race, 2706. Spinach. Look at that kitten. What you doing, Wolf? What you doing, baby? It is my last ski before the race tomorrow in Jackson, New Hampshire. And I'm out testing the longer poles that I just got. So thank you for your support. I appreciate that. And it's interesting, when I started skiing, the poles felt too long. I was like, uh-oh, I'm not used to them anymore. I got used to 
the shorter versions. But after about 20 minutes, I really started to get back into it and the Kruger just fell into place. So the missing piece to kind of finish off my Kruger technique was longer poles. And now that I've got them, I can really feel the difference and my skating has moved to another level. So I'm excited to test that out tomorrow. I may not have enough time on the longer poles to be able to use them for an entire race. It's 25 kilometers um, because I haven't used long poles now for a month. We'll see. But anyway, they feel great. My technique is on and uh, it's a great day to ski and heading off today around five. Drive up to the White Mountains in New Hampshire and uh, I'll show you what it looks like up there. It's beautiful. form and back on the desk I don't know what that means <laughs> I'm confused took me a little over four hours to get to Jackson New Hampshire where I am right now beautiful village uh, one of my favorite places and my butt is sore uh, I stopped a few times to use the massage gun but it's still pretty sore so I'm going to stretch and massage some more really intense listening session to the archaeology of mind. That was a, a pretty huge information download. Thank goodness I record notes as I go, so I don't have to worry about retaining it all immediately. And uh, yeah, probably going to go to bed early, have a little snack, and uh, wake up and show you the beautiful village of Jackson. I just looked at the registration list and yikes. One name stood out to me, Carl Swenson. Carl was the New Hampshire state champion when I was a senior in high school and he went on to be the best skier in New England and then went on to be a multi-time Olympian. So Carl and I are about the same age and I haven't raced against him since the 80s. <laughs> so this will be interesting. And David Herr is here as well. David is a beast in his 50s. Uh, yeah, so very, very studly over 50 crew here. There's something strange under the TV that's taped down and it's got a glassy little bulb right there. Is that a spy cam or is it a really old TV and that's the remote sensor? I don't know. I don't like it. I don't trust it. I'm going to cover it up. Just got an email from the race director. Uh, I didn't know what the course was going to look like. So that is quite a climb. We climbed for pretty much 16 kilometers or 10 miles from 200 meters to 600 meters, and then down for the final uh, 8K. So that's gonna be beastly. Um, look like pretty steep climbs from, I don't know, nine to 11 kilometers. Yikes, okay, not much V2 tomorrow. <laughs> To avoid pulling myself in the chest again, I'm going to forego a water bottle and carry three little Dollar Tree salad dressing containers with silicon bodies and a big opening. Really easy to manipulate, buck 25 a piece at Dollar Tree. And I've got a little belt with some pockets to put them in. They're gonna be easy in and out. I've already tested it. Uh, much better than a water bottle. And I'm gonna put water, some electrolyte powder, 
Uh, I forget what I got. It was on a sale at the discount store I go to. I don't even know the brand. And some raw sugar. So, uh, turbinado sugar, I guess. And I'm going to mix that up and have probably about 90 calories per. So that would be 270 calories to drink while I'm out there. All right. Hopefully it works. I'm going galactic today. <laughs> Second overall and first in my age group in front of Rob Riley, who is a super stud, and Carl Swenson, who's a multiple Olympian. So, pretty pumped. This is the perfect prize. <laughs> that was an awesome race. I don't even know where to begin talking about it. Well, how about this? I got second overall again. Uh, but this was a much more competitive race than Lake Placid. And I'm reluctant to say this, but this might have been a harder course. I think we climbed 1,700 feet. Uh, <laughs> just kept going up and up. Anyway, uh, Chris Burnham, who won the race, who is normally miles ahead of me. Uh, I have to look at my previous results, but he's always in a shorter race, in a 10K. He'll beat me by five minutes. So he caught me at 2K. He started 30 seconds behind me. One person every 15 seconds. So Chris caught me. Uh, then I just sped up and skied with him. And that was great because in all the other races I've done, except Worlds, the good people are way ahead of me. So I don't get to see their pace. I don't get to see what techniques they're using at what points. Because you're always switching techniques. Did a lot of V1, but also V2'd quite a bit of the hills. Uh, whenever I could. Um, and maybe at around 13k he pulled away a little bit because there was a little downhill section before the final climb to 15, 16k. And uh, he probably put 15 seconds on me. But then I V2'd the final climb and caught back up. But then when we crested, he was, I don't know, maybe two, three seconds ahead of me and his skis were so much faster than mine today, which is how he got that 15 second gap and he was gone. I didn't see him on any of the downhills. He just, his skis rocketed and uh, he put a minute on me on the downhill. The final 8K were pretty much downhill, but that's okay. It's one of the challenges of cross country skiing. Your wax, your skis make a huge difference. Uh, and his skis were also gliding better on the uphill. If they're gliding better on the downhill, that means they're also gliding better on the flats and the uphill. So I had to put in more effort to stay with him throughout the race. So I'm super happy. Thank you to Chris Burnham for pulling me along and pulling a great race out of me. Anyway, huge success. Now I'm going to take a leisurely drive through the White Mountains. I'll do some video, show you what it looks like. I really love this area. It's too bad it's four hours away because it's, uh, it's like Vermont plus. Sorry. Just finished collecting the sap buckets that were full. I've already dumped a three liter container in there. I'm gonna boil these down and I'm thinking of taking some of them and just boiling them down until they're half volume instead of a 40 time reduction. So to make maple syrup, it's one gallon of syrup is made out of 40 gallons of sap. But if I boil it down two gallons down to one, it would be twice as sweet as sap and the boiling would help preserve it because this doesn't last long, it spoils after about five days. Uh, and then freezing it and drinking it throughout the year. That's a thought. As I was getting my things into the car at Prospect Post Ski, I noticed I have another headlight out. It's been about a month since I replaced the right bulb and now the left bulb has gone, which makes sense, I guess. 
So went to the auto parts store, got a bulb. And as I was driving back here to the studio, I felt this annoyance in me. I didn't want to change it. I didn't want to have to open the hood. For some reason, opening the hood seems monumental. Didn't want to get my fingers greasy. Didn't want to futz around in there because it's pretty hard to do. And you can't touch the glass part because your finger grease significantly decreases the life of the bulb. So you can only touch the bottom, which makes it even more difficult to get in and align. They're super hard to align. So I hear these voices, I feel these urges, and like everything else, whether it be the stairs versus the elevator, I'm just going to reach down, pull the hood release, reach to the handle, open it up, the door, go out, lift the hood, and step by step, I will put a bulb in, even though there's no part of me consciously that wants to do it. But I don't need to want to do it. I just need to take the steps where it gets done because um, I can't drive home with just one bulb. Anyway, going to do that now, but it's always curious, the, the voices of no, can't, won't, uh, and how I simply step around them. I don't need to be motivated. I just need to grab the hood release. So here we go. Going to grab the hood release. Another week has come to an end. And as I just finished my last writing of today's workout, I'm looking at the week and noticing that it's rather slim in the strength training. And I'm not exactly sure why that happened because I don't have a plan. Nothing that I do is planned. <laughs> so it might have something to do with me still recovering from this illness, which is like six weeks ongoing now. I'm mostly over it. And the tightness in my chest and back is leaving. So that might have had something to do with it. I don't know because I don't force myself to try to do anything. I may also have been subconsciously tapering for the race that I did yesterday because this kind of felt like a mini world championships. There were some very, very good skiers there yesterday. Uh, skiers that I have not even come close to beating in the past. I don't like that term beating. So let's just say that I haven't skied as fast as they have. In fact, not even close, minutes behind them. So seeing how I stacked up yesterday and seeing who was registered in advance uh, makes me feel more confident about my fitness because this is an experiment after all. So am I in potential podium shape for world championships? I think I'm pretty close. And with a couple more weeks, I think I would have been right there on the edge. Uh, Rob Riley, who got fourth in the race yesterday, he's in my age group. He was minutes ahead of me at the race in Craftsbury, and he was not too far behind Luc Tremblay from Quebec, who got second at the Worlds last year in my age group. So I'm now in between Rob and Luc, and with a little bit more practice of my Simon Kruger V2, uh, I think uh, I think I'd be. Yeah, I don't know. I'm in good shape. I'm skiing well, so that feels good and I don't need to spend $2,500 to discover that. Anyway, I'm gonna go home, almost done with the book, The Archaeology of Mind. I listened for about 10 hours, Friday and Saturday, back and forth to the race and at the hotel. So much good information in this book. I'm absolutely loving it. It might be a five-star book. We will see. Um, yeah, more information on the contents hopefully coming up in future videos because there's so much that I want to share, but I don't want these videos to just continue to increase in length. Anyway, on that note, I bid you adieu and I will see you next week.